Section eleven of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter twenty one. Reginald's revelations were followed by a long silence, interrupted only by the officiousness of the waiter. The spell once broken, they exchanged a number of more or less irrelevant observations. Ethel's mind returned again and again to the word he had not spoken. He had said nothing of the immediate bearing of his monstrous power upon her own life and that of Ernest Fielding. At last, somewhat timidly, she approached the subject. "'You said you loved me,' she remarked. "'I did.' "'But why, then?' "'I could not help it.' "'Did you ever make the slightest attempt?' In the horrible night hours I struggled against it. I even implored you to leave me. Ah, but I loved you. You would not be warned. You would not listen. You stayed with me, and slowly, surely, the creative urge went out of your life. But what on earth could you find in my poor art to attract you? What were my pictures to you? I needed them. I needed you. It was a certain something, a rich colour effect, perhaps. And then, under your very eyes, the colour that vanished from your canvases reappeared in my prose. My style became more luxurious than it had been, while you tortured your soul in the vain attempt of calling back to your brush what was irretrievably lost. Why did you not tell me? You would have laughed in my face, and I could not have endured your laugh. Besides, I always hoped, until it was too late, that I might yet check the mysterious power within me. Soon, however, I became aware that it was beyond my control. The unknown God, whose instrument I am, had wisely made it stronger than me. "'But why,' retorted Ethel, "'was it necessary to discard me like a cast-off garment, like a wanton who has lost the power to please?' Her frame shook with the remembered emotion of that moment, when years ago he had politely told her that she was nothing to him. "'The law of being,' Reginald replied, almost sadly, "'the law of my being. I should have pitied you, but the eternal reproach of your suffering only provoked my anger. I cared less for you every day, and when I had absorbed all of you that my growth required, you were to me as one dead, as a stranger you were.' There was between us no further community of interest. Henceforth, I knew, our lives must move in totally different spheres. You remember that day when we said good-bye?" "'You mean that day when I lay before you on my knees,' she corrected him. "'The day I buried my last dream of personal happiness. I would have gladly raised you from the floor, but love was utterly gone. If I am tenderer to-day than I am wont to be, it is because you mean so much to me as the symbol of my renunciation. When I realized that I could not even save the thing I loved from myself, I became hardened and cruel to others. Not that I know no kindly feeling, but no qualms of conscience lay their prostrate forms across my path. There is nothing in life for me but my mission." His face was bathed in ecstasy. The pupils were luminous, large, and threatening. He had the look of a madman or a prophet. After a while Ethel remarked, "'But you have grown into one of the master figures of the age. Why not be content with that? Is there no limit to your ambition?' Reginald smiled. "'Ambition! Shakespeare stopped when he had reached his full growth, when he had exhausted the capacities of his contemporaries. I am not yet ready to lay down my pen and rest.' And will you always continue in this criminal course, a murderer of other lives?" He looked her calmly in the face. "'I do not know.' "'Are you the slave of your unknown god?' "'We are all slaves, wire-pulled marionettes. You, Ernest, I. There is no freedom on the face of the earth, nor above. The tiger that tears a lamb is not free. I am not free. You are not free. All that happens must happen. No word that is said is said in vain. In vain is raised no hand." "'Then,' Ethel retorted eagerly, "'if I attempted to wrest your victim from you, I should also be the tool of your god?' "'Assuredly. But I am his chosen.' "'Can you—can you not set him free?' "'I need him—a little longer. Then he is yours. 
But can you not, if I beg you again on my knees, at least loosen his chains before he is utterly ruined? It is beyond my power. If I could not rescue you, whom I loved, what in heaven or on earth can save him from his fate? Besides, he will not be utterly ruined. It is only a part of him that I absorb. In his soul are cords that I have not touched. They may vibrate one day when he has gathered new strength. You, too, would have spared yourself much pain had you striven to attain success in different fields, not where I had garnered the harvest of a lifetime. It is only a portion of his talent that I take from him. The rest I cannot harm. Why should he bury that remainder?" His eyes strayed through the window to the firmament, as if to say that words could no more bend his indomitable will than alter the changeless course of the stars. Ethel had half forgotten the wrong she had herself suffered at his hands. He could not be measured by ordinary standards, this dazzling madman, whose diseased will-power had assumed such uncanny proportions. But here a young life was at stake. In her mind's eye she saw Reginald crush between his relentless hands the delicate soul of Ernest Fielding, as a magnificent carnivorous flower might close its glorious petals upon a fly. Love, all-conquering love, welled up in her. She would fight for Ernest as a tiger-cat fights for its young. She would place herself in the way of the awful force that had shattered her own aspirations, and save at any cost the brilliant boy who did not love her. CHAPTER Twenty Two, The last rays of the late afternoon sun fell slanting through Ernest's window. He was lying on his couch in a leaden, death-like slumber, that for the moment at least was not even perturbed by the presence of Reginald Clark. The latter was standing at the boy's bedside, calm, unmoved as ever. The excitement of his conversation with Ethel had left no trace on the chiselled contour of his forehead. Smilingly fastening an orchid of an indefinable purple tint in his evening coat, radiant, buoyant with life, he looked down upon the sleeper. Then he passed his hand over Ernest's forehead, as if to wipe off beads of sweat. At the touch of his hand the boy stirred uneasily. When it was not withdrawn his countenance twitched in pain. He moaned as men moan under the influence of some anaesthetic, without possessing the power to break through the narrow partition that separates them from death, on the one side, and from consciousness on the other. At last a sigh struggled to his seemingly paralyzed lips, then another. Finally the babbling became articulate. "'For God's sake!' he cried in his sleep. "'Take that hand away!' and all at once the benignant smile on Reginald's features was changed to a look of savage fierceness. He no longer resembled the man of culture, but a disappointed, snarling beast of prey. He took his hand from Ernest's forehead, and retired cautiously through the half-open door. Hardly had he disappeared when Ernest woke. For a moment he looked around, like a hunted animal, then sighed with relief and buried his head in his hand. At that moment a knock at the door was heard, and Reginald re-entered calm as before. "'I declare,' he exclaimed, "'you have certainly been sleeping the sleep of the just.' "'It isn't laziness,' Ernest replied, looking up rather pleased at the interruption. "'But I've a splitting headache. Perhaps those naps are not good for your health.' "'Probably. But of late I have frequently found it necessary to exact from the day-hours the sleep which the night refuses me. I suppose it is all due to indigestion, as you have suggested. The stomach is the source of all evil. It is also the source of all good. The Greeks made it the seat of the soul. I have always claimed that the most important item in a great poet's biography is an exact reproduction of his menu. True, a man who eats a heavy beefsteak for breakfast in the morning is incapable of writing a sonnet in the afternoon. Yes, Reginald added, we are what we eat, and what our forefathers have eaten before us. I ascribe the staleness of American poetry to the griddle-cakes of our Puritan ancestors. I am sorry we cannot go deeper into the subject at present. But I have an invitation to dinner where I shall study, experimentally, the influence of French sauces on my versification. Good-bye. Au revoir." And with a wave of the hand Reginald left the room. When the door had closed behind him, Ernest's thoughts took a more serious turn. The tone of light bantering in which the preceding conversation had taken place had been assumed on his part. For the last few weeks evil dreams had tortured his sleep and cast their shadow upon his waking hours. They had ever increased in reality, 
in intensity and in hideousness. Even now he could see the long, tapering fingers that every night were groping in the windings of his brain. It was a well-formed, manicured hand that seemed to reach under his skull, carefully feeling its way through the myriad convolutions where thought resides. And, oh, the agony of it all! A human mind is not a thing of stone, but alive, horribly alive to pain. What was it those fingers sought, what mysterious treasures, what jewels hidden in the underlayer of his consciousness? His brain was like a human gold-mine, quaking under the blow of the pick and the tread of the miner. The miner! Ah, the miner! Ceaselessly, thoroughly, relentlessly, he opened vein after vein and wrested untold riches from the quivering ground, but each vein was a live vein, and each nugget of gold a thought. No wonder the boy was a nervous wreck. Whenever a tremulous, nascent idea was formulating itself, the dream-hand clutched it and took it away, brutally severing the fine threads that bind thought to thought. And when the morning came, how his head ached! It was not an acute pain, but dull, heavy, incessant. These sensations, Ernest frequently told himself, were morbid fantasies. But then the monomaniac who imagines that his arms have been mangled or cut from his body might as well be without arms. Mind can annihilate obstacles. It can also create them. Psychology was no unfamiliar ground to Ernest, and it was not difficult for him to seek in some casual suggestion an explanation for his delusion, the fixed notion that haunted him day and night. But he also realized that to explain a phenomenon is not to explain it away. The man who analyzes his emotions cannot wholly escape them, and the shadow of fear, primal, inexplicable fear, may darken at moments of weakness the life of the subtlest psychologist and the cleverest thinker. He had never spoken to Reginald of his terrible nightmares. Coming on the heel of the fancy that he, Ernest, had written The Princess with the Yellow Veil, a fancy, by the way, had again possessed him of late, this new delusion would certainly arouse suspicion as to his sanity in Reginald's mind. He would probably send him to a sanitarium. He certainly would not keep him in the house. Beneficence itself in all other things, his host was not to be trifled with in any matter that interfered with his work. He would act swiftly and without mercy. For the first time in many days Ernest thought of Abel Felton. Poor boy! What had become of him after he had been turned from the house? He would not wait for any one to tell him to pack his bundle. But then that was impossible. Reginald was fond of him. Suddenly Ernest's meditations were interrupted by a noise at the outer door. A key was turned in the lock. It must be he. But why so soon? What could have brought him back at this hour? He opened the door and went out into the hall to see what had happened. The figure that he beheld was certainly not the person he expected, but a woman, from whose shoulders a theatre cloak fell in graceful folds, probably a visitor for Reginald. Ernest was about to withdraw discreetly, when the electric light that was burning in the hallway fell upon her face and illumined it. Then, indeed, surprise overcame him. Ethel, he cried, is it you? End of section 11